G'day and welcome to the Grow Small Business Podcast. I'm your host, Troy Truen. Each week, we speak with an owner who has grown a business with 5 to 30 team members to something bigger. Diving into their numbers and unearthing the pain they've experienced, we explore what they did to overcome each barrier and what they would do differently from day one. Let's get into it. Welcome, everyone. Today, I'm interviewing Chris Mercer, also known as Mercer, from measurementmarketing.io, based in beautiful Austin, Texas, USA. Thanks for your time today, Mercer. Appreciate it. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me, Troy. Let's start with how we know each other. It was Dana at uh, or Dana at Legendary Lead Gen that put us in touch. It was. Yeah. It was. Yeah. Tell our audience a bit about your business, what it does, and how it makes money. So our, our companies, I'm a co-founder of a company called measurementmarketing.io. It's our job to sort of help marketers, marketing teams, and agencies figure out how they measure their marketing. In other words, what their numbers are, what numbers are important to measure, what to do with those numbers so that ultimately they can grow the numbers. That's kind of our thing. And we'll do this through teaching them how to use tools like analytics and tag manager, data studio, that sort of stuff. I think it's hugely valuable, uh, this, this topic we're going to speak about today, um, to our audience in particular. It just reminds me, I love that old marketing adage, which is 50% of advertising is wasted. You just don't know which 50%. That's exactly right. John Watermaker. Yes. I mean, that describes the old, the old way, print, et cetera, and TV and radio. You had no really accurate way to measure engagement and traction, et cetera. Whereas obviously now digital particularly, it's just, it's a, it's a wonderful time to be alive as a marketeer. Yeah, it really is. And it could be a lot easier. The challenge now, of course, is the opposite. Instead of knowing kind of what, you know, knowing any number, which is the challenge before it's you have every number. Yes. Which is still not knowing your numbers. It's just, you have too many, right? Yeah. Having numbers is not knowing the numbers. And, yeah. that's, and that's what I think a lot of challenges. People just turn on these, these platforms and they get inundated with data. And then they're like, forget it. I can go do what this means or what to do with it. Let me just go back to changing the headline and see if that's going to work. Yeah. And that's, and that happens a lot, unfortunately, but it doesn't have to. And uh, so, so how does measurement marketing die? Like what's your revenue model? Do you have different ways of charging? We do. Yeah, we actually have, we started as a high-end agency that was just doing the works. We had kind of, we saw the limited done for you work where we set up measurement systems. Then we have done with you training. This is for larger organizations where they want to train their team to have a measurement marketing culture. So they get assigned an instructor and they go through that program. And then there is do it yourself level, which is the program we call the measurement marketing Academy. And it's a essentially a just in time learning platform. That's got a ton of courses every week. There's new workshops and there's a bunch of different workshops back there. And there's instructors that are there to help out the students. So the students can send over videos and say, Hey, here's where I'm stuck. Or I'm not even sure what to do with this. What would you do? And the instructors send back videos too. So it sort of has that consultant like approach. And that's how we make the majority of our income. And now is in the training model because years ago, even though I could absolutely build out a very large agency, just doing done for you work. I didn't personally find the fuel in that. I found the fuel in turning on the light bulbs and showing somebody what was possible and giving them just a slightly different way of looking at something. And I'm going, okay, I can never unsee that. My world is now different forever. And that's what I love doing. So that's why I really turned the company more into a training organization because it fueled me. So the more work with you, that's the bulk of, of your revenue at the moment, rather than de- uh, most of our revenue is to do it yourself. Oh, it is to do yourself. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's to do it yourself. Yeah, for sure. And then and then it will go up to the done with you, and then finally to the done for you, because we do have some legacy clients that we've kept around for many yep. many years now. Now we're kind of considered part of their team, uh, essentially. But uh, but at this point, we have certifications that we will train an agency to sell this if they wanted to, to create it as a business model, and then we refer that work over to to our certified measurement marketers. So that's how that cool. helps us. Great. And how did you start out? Uh, Good question. We actually started as uh, I started. So my background is sales management. So I'm very used to managing the sales pipeline and and that sort of thing through a wide variety of industries. But when I flipped to digital, it was kind of like, okay, we're going to, we're going to make this thing a thing. We're going to figure out if this is a real thing or not, right? Like everybody does. And I started a website to essentially show people how to build WordPress sites. So I did that. That led very quickly into the, the members saying, well, listen, this is great, but it's a lot of work. So of course, the next obvious question is, can you just build the WordPress sites? So I'm like, yep. okay, sure. So I learned outsourcing. We start to hire, we build a little team. Now we're kind of a commodity because everyone's doing WordPress sites back then. Yep. This is about a decade or so ago. So now we said, okay, well, at, in the States anyway, it was, it was kind of new-ish, this idea of conversion rate optimization. It wasn't being practiced. It was kind of new on the scene. And so it was like, well, we'll build your site and we're going to help you optimize it. And of course, in order to optimize, you must first measure. Yes. So we would then build these WordPress sites. We would deliver them with their analytics intact and say, okay, here's how you can see how many leads are coming from Facebook or how many sales that email is creating. And here's what you need to do. And almost overnight, from the second that we made that little switch, the referrals 
dramatically change. And this is just a, a lesson that we learned very early on, which is listening to the market because the market is the only one that's got the answers, right? So we almost overnight, it was, hey, uh, my buddy asked me to you know, reach out to you. We actually already have a, web, a WordPress site. We don't need another site. What we need though, is that analytics thing that you did for them. How, yep. do, we, how do you do that? And so that's when we pivoted. And we said, there's, because nobody was teaching it and nobody was setting it up in a way that was useful because people generally, and still to, to this day, don't realize that it needs to be set up. They think they turn it on and yep. now they've got numbers so they can start using those numbers, but that's not at all correct. Um, and so we sort of decided it was, that was our mission. That was our pivot. And that's where measurement marketing to IO was eventually born. And what year did you start out in business? And then what, and what year was that pivot? 2011 is when we officially uh, got on with the, the first site and by 2013. So it wasn't that long. It was about a couple of years. Yeah, right. Where we pivoted into measurement marketing to IO. And then ever since then, that, it may have been even 2012. Now I think about it. It was, it was right around when Google Tag Manager was released, which I believe was 2012. Yep. As that came on. And 2011, when you started out in business, how old were you then? Uh, so at that point, I was, a uh, good question, 35? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, around 35. Uh, not my first business, though. My first business was when I was 20. So I was an entrepreneur, you know, kind of way back in the day when I had a nightclub. And um, that was that was a lot of fun. But <laughs> yeah. I learned, it's one of those things you learn a lot of lessons on. Like, yes, here's bit. some things I won't be doing again the <laughs> next time I do this. <laughs> you would have said uh, a lot of stuff. This is, yeah, it's a lot of good stories, a lot of fun. I learned a lot. And this is uh, this was definitely a business, though. This is the, the longest I've ever worked for any company is my own, Yeah, uh, which is which is nice to say, you know, now. Yeah, me too. That's great. Mm -hmm. Do you have any key numbers you can share to illustrate the growth of the business over the, well, now 10, 10 years? Yeah. I mean, obviously, it started at zero, right? Yep. As, as we all do, it started as an individual sort of freelancer helping and doing all this thing and working all the time. Um, and, and you kind of move from, for me, the, the, the challenge from an entrepreneurial mindset was to go from that hustle entrepreneur, which is kind of what I think the freelancer is. It's like, you're just hustling, doing your thing. And you do need to do that up to a certain point, maybe a hundred grand of revenue or something. And then after that, you, you have to let it not be that the results are coming from a person, but they're coming from a system. Mm -hmm. You move into learning process. And so that's what we did. So over the years, it was very quickly. I said within the first year, I moved from kind of the individual freelancer uh, you know, past the six figures into bringing on team members and getting process. And then over the last maybe two or three years, we've probably averaged at least 20% growth year over year. Right. Um, for the last three years, we're now at uh, nine FTE uh, yep. full-time. We've got them four in the States here and then the rest are in the Philippines, but everyone's yep. full-time. Um, so that's, that's worked out really well for us. And it's been a process of... Uh, Every day that we we pull, I personally try to pull back just a little bit more and make sure that the system is doing the work, not me. So it's finding other instructors in my case that are teaching some of these things, but understanding what is the measurement marketing dial way of teaching and how do I teach that process to some other instructor so that we can produce a similar product that I would normally create on my own naturally, right? So that sort of stuff is really where we've been uh, focusing. Me, I've personally been focusing on as an entrepreneur. Yeah, that's good. And it's a great attitude from, it sounds like almost day one is to scramble up the org chart, delegate down um, and, you know, leverage other people rather than just effectively, as Gerber talks about in the e-myth, you know, buying yourself a job. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. And in the beginning, you can get very trapped at that, right? Yeah. Realizing, oh, I want, I want the freedom. And it's my favorite joke about entrepreneurs is you get to work half days, you pick any 12 hours you want. I love that because <laughs> yes. it's so true. It it's is. so true. Uh, and you just don't realize it until yeah. you get into it. Then you're, then you're stuck because you got mm. bit by the bug. And you're like, well, yeah. I'm going to have to figure it out now. Mm. Um, but, that, but that is where, you know, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. The way that I look at it in my organization is I have 40 roles, right? And when you're starting out, even if you're one person, you still have the 40 roles as yep. a janitor and the bookkeeper and the accountant and the producer and whatever, mm. the salesperson, right? And so my job was looking at that org chart every day and figuring out how can I get myself out of another one of those spots. Yep. Ultimately, ultimately, like within a decade, I would like to be have one role in my organization, mm. which is the investor role. Yes. Right. So that everything manager down is taking care of somebody else. I am just the investor. Just like yep. Amazon doesn't call me about anything. I own their stock and that's it. I'm an investor in the organization. Yep. Do not care about how they ship and they don't call me to get stuff done. Right? Yeah. That's what I want from our organization. So that's sort of what I do entrepreneurially. That's my plan is doing that with multiple brands because I like diversification. Yeah, good. And on uh, offshoring, so I've got three team members in the Philippines, one in Pakistan. How long ago did you look to Philip moving You know, some of your team using some from the Philippines and what's your experience been? It's been exceptional. Um, I think in hiring in general, uh, part of my background was in recruiting, which was mm -hmm. nice because I sort of had that hiring down already. Um, pro tip for hiring, by the way, you don't hire to hire somebody, you hire to not hire everybody. 
Yep. And whoever's left is the right person, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people are trying to find the right person. The goal is get rid of the wrong people because they're easier to see. Um, But when I was going through and and working there, there's obviously the always just, hey, you're dealing with humans. So you're going to have some misfires occasionally. Mm -hmm. And we did. Um, But by and large, our process, I just, our process is pretty refined, very structured and designed to weed people out fast and hard. It is hard to get in our organization, but when you're in our organization, you stay. Um, So like we've got one guy that's just celebrated his eight years. uh, Wow. Mm. So it's like, you know, another one's uh, four years, another one's almost five years. Another one just started with us coming up on our first year. So it's like, you know, long-term, that's what I want. I want somebody, and I, especially in the Philippines, which is, it's a, highly talented market, totally great. great people that are out there. Yep. And if you can go there and say, listen, we're thinking decades here. Don't think like how many months are you going to work for this? I'm not a project yep. gig kind of guy. That's not, not what I'm looking mm-hmm. for. I'm looking for somebody who wants to help grow the company and then wants to learn how to grow up in a company. So yep. I teach them how to create systems so that, that we can eventually hire other people that they can help manage as they build their departments. Yeah, that's great. I think that my first offshore team member was about four years ago, and I've been really happy. The Philippines in particular, I think the population there, I think 87% are Catholic. So there's a lot of Catholic guilt there, a really strong work ethic. And, <laughs> and right. uh, uh, I'm an ex altar boy, so <laughs> raising. Oh, there you, so you know. Yeah, so I know. Kindred spirit. Kindred spirit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One of them still e- emails me Sir Troy, and I've asked her so many you, times. I still get that. Yeah, over the four. Please yeah. stop drop the sir and she just won't it's very sweet but anyway <laughs> yeah no they're great work ethic english is excellent obviously after yep. the occupation of world war ii uh, america it was uh yeah and highly educated as well all, yeah and it really is it's incredible talent the, the, the thing i learned about the philippines early on was uh by and large for the most part the the, the things they get are things like oh well do these seo backlinks and comments so they, they connect the wires a lot, but they don't necessarily know they're building an iPhone or how to build an iPhone. Yep. So they know, so they very tactical skills, but if you can find somebody that's got a great attitude, has mm-hmm. the tactical skills that you need yep. and you can teach strategy, yes. right? So that's what I look for when I hire is the questioning. I want them to question me. Like I tell them all the time. It's like, I might point off a cliff and be like, let's all go off that cliff. Yeah. I said, two things need to happen. You need to stop me. <laughs> one. And it's because two things are happening. One is you all have parachutes and just didn't realize it. So I will explain that to you. Yep. Two, I go, oh, sorry, I meant that way, <laughs> right? <laughs> but if I don't have them question me, everybody just runs off a cliff. And I see a lot of business owners do that with their teams, where their teams are afraid to question them. Just go, well, this yep. is what it's like. I guess we'll do this again. And they just get used to the chaos and they get trained to be chaotic. Yeah. Um, and I and I want that pushback. And, and you can find some, again, credible talent, uh, Philippines and everywhere else. But yeah. that's the type of person I I can uh, I like working with. Yeah, it's it's dangerous that shitty autocratic culture that you know you're here to work do as I say, not that collaborative team, yes. true culture. So, yeah. we'll talk and, how, and how do I grow out of the organization if I'm always yeah. there? If I have yeah. to be in the room to make anything happen, right? Yeah. So it's it's in my own selfish interest to make sure they are getting out of their own way. Half the time I take a vacation, the company does better. It's just <laughs> weird. It's so it's, weird. A bit like Tim Ferriss. Like, it was, yeah, it's like yeah. you get in the way and you realize, like, oh man, I should, I should just not show up more often. Yeah, you read the four hour work week. Oh, Tim, yeah. oh yeah, yeah. Tim Ferriss. I think early in the book, he had a he decided to have a holiday. Finally, had a breakdown in London when he got there and decided to travel Europe for six months or something. And the business doubled while he was away because he was yeah. forced to get out of the way. Mm. Yeah, because a lot of times we create chaos. Yep. You know? I, I I remember when I was first starting out, there was an absolute point in time. And I learned this because of that bar. Remember I said I owned that bar when I was in my yep. 20s? I, the same pattern kicked in where it's like I built the company to a point. We were probably half the size we are now. Yep. Uh, but I was making a comfortable living. I mm-hmm. was making, I had a little bit more money than I needed every month. And it was practically automated. And I didn't have to do much for it. The team was doing their thing. And it was like, oh, I, I actually got what was on the brochure. I can go work on the beach in Thailand and do nothing. <laughs> so it was like, I was, for, for me, that was Netflix, right? Because I don't do a ton of travel. So it was like, well, I was watching Netflix, watching Netflix, maybe a little too much. Yep. For, you know, and, and then what was happening was you start, I realized there was this pattern kicking into my head where it was like, maybe not returning emails as fast as I normally would. Maybe not doing the Asana, you know, keeping up with my tasks as fast as I normally would. And it was this self-sabotage mechanism. Mm-hmm. And I stopped myself and it was like, why are you doing that? So I have something to do. So I can be the entrepreneurial hero. So I can come in and fix stuff again, because now yeah. it's just a process and process is boring, man. Mm-hmm. I don't want to process. I want to create, I yeah. want a blank whiteboard so I can create new stuff. <laughs> so that's when immediately I go, okay, I got to create systems. That's yep. my new mission in life. And then I got to get the systems to go up and then go up a little higher and go up yep. a little higher and make them better mm-hmm. and better. And that's my challenge. 
And so once I made that switch, it leveled up the organization. It was able to, revenues went up, obviously FTEs go up, everything goes up at that point. And you just dedicate to systems. And I never gotten bored That's again good. because yeah. of that. So that was a, a little a little pro tip. My biggest lesson growing an organization was that, yeah. is, is being aware of that self-sabotage. I see a lot of entrepreneurs do that. Yeah. I've seen million dollar companies do that. They go up and they implode themselves and they reinvent and they implode. They reinvent and they implode. And it's because there's control. There's too much control at the top. When was the moment you felt like you'd succeeded? Um, it was when I took, it wasn't my first break because my first break, I was basically just panicking the entire time thinking that obviously I'm not there. So everything's on fire. Um, <laughs> but it was where I did a week. I did a week in a cabin in the woods in Yosemite. So I went out to California for a week. It was just myself, just by myself. And I disconnected and said, I'm going off grid for a week just to not check in. I'm not going to check email. I won't answer my phone. Like nobody call me, consider me gone. And I went to a place that had really crap internet. So <laughs> it was kind of, it was kind of like a, a self-imposed thing. So I go out there and I, and I just spent the week and did hiking and did my thing and didn't worry about anything and came back and everything was just fine. Yeah, no major fires. No, everybody took care of stuff. If there were any issues, people knew what to do, and it was just it just worked. And it was like there was like this, oh, like, wow, okay, yeah. it like okay, like that's good. Now, could I have done that for six months? I doubt it. Yeah, because um, each week probably would have degraded a little bit. But that was just the early. That was years ago, right? That was that yeah. system at that point in time. It was like all right, that system. I get it. It kind of worked. The plate kept spinning without me having to constantly hit it all the time or think that I had to. And so that's what, that was my biggest, like, okay, I got this. Like now we let's just keep, now let's make it six months. <laughs> now let's make it a year. Let's make it, now let's make it so I don't have to come in for 10 years, you know? And that's my getting to my investor role. Yeah, that's good. What does success look like to you? Uh, for me, it is, it is definitely the system definition. Did I produce the result or did the system produce the result? So that's what I look for. So if, if I, for example, if I have to create a course for the, for the measurement marketing Academy, I might create a course on like learning server side tag manager or something like that. If I am the one that has to learn that, practice that, figure out how to teach it and then teach it, like that's okay because maybe that's what I have to do. But if I can figure out the system for what a course looks like that works well for our members, find an instructor who already knows the content and merge those two, that's better yeah. because now it's the system producing that course. And of course, I can teach people how to do what I just did so I can get somebody else to create that. So now I'm out of courses. And so that's what success looks to me is, is looking and saying, did the system produce the result or did the person produce the result? If it's a person, that's great, but you're kind of lucky and you, you just got to hope that that person's going to stick around or remember what they remembered the last time to produce the result. But if it's the system, it's a predictable, scalable result. <laughs> this next question is, uh, is perfect for you to talk to. Number one thing you'd recommend to marketing a fast growing business. To marketing a fast growing business, I would say is... <sighs> I would absolutely say you have to measure. It's yep. a little self-serving, mm. but you have to have visibility into what work, what's working or what's not. So there's a lot of companies out there. It's what I call a curse of a good offer. Like a, a company will come to us, and sadly, but this is true. They, they might have uh, give Facebook a hundred bucks for that day. And Facebook gives them a thousand dollars in sales. And they're like, Ooh, let's give Facebook a thousand dollars in sales. And Facebook gives them $10,000. And they're like, Ooh, let's give Facebook $10,000. And then Facebook gives them a hundred thousand dollars in sales. And they're like, yes, let's give Facebook a hundred thousand dollars. And Facebook keeps it. And then they're like, <laughs> okay, what just happened? They all look around because now they've scaled the organization. They've hired teams. They've got inventory coming in from God knows where, right? Big giant things. They've complicated their tech. They've And now Facebook all of a sudden stopped working and they all look around. They're like, what happened? What do we need to fix? And everyone's like, I don't know. Because nobody knew. It wasn't that they were afraid of what wasn't working. They didn't care because it was working. And this is the old adage of like, I don't care as long as it makes money. I, like I get that. But that's incredibly dangerous because mm. when it doesn't make money, you won't know what broke, right? You won't know what broke. And so to be successful, you have to understand how things are not working. You also, even more importantly, have to understand how they are working because yep. when they are working, you can start to market forward and, and you change your mindset. So instead of looking back all the time saying, what just happened to the money I spent? You start saying, hey, next week, we're going to get Facebook $100,000. Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to get 90,000 views to my page. And of those 25% of those are going to opt in of those seven, within seven days, I'm going to sell half of them through email for X amount of dollars. Yep. And then you measure against that forecast. So the second, the second something doesn't work as expected, you go, oh, that blip. Let's focus on that step. We got to fix that. Whether it's on the Facebook end or whether it's on your end, or whether it's the technical issue, you'll see it in the numbers because your market will be screaming at you that they didn't like this one part. Yep. 
Any other tips or advice you, you'd give high level, I guess, around marketing um, for small business? Because I think it's a really underutilized and, and resourced area, or you know, for small yeah. business owners, and, and yet yeah. so important. The- I'll tell you the biggest mindset shift for me was, and, and this is again, pro tip, I guess a little bit from a tactic is I always look at everything offline. What's the offline component? How does it work in the offline world? And will it work on the online world? You know, like that sort of thing. So I was looking at that. So the biggest aha for me wasn't that there are tools like Google Analytics and I got to start using because that's more tactical stuff. It was a mindset shift. And here's what I mean by that. If, if I, you and I, let's use the shoe store example. I have a shoe store. You come into my shoe store. I say, hey, welcome to the shoe store. What can I help you with? I need some sneakers. Okay, let's go look at the sneakers. I will try to get you to try on some sneakers, hopefully get you to buy another pair. Maybe I'll tell you some socks along the way, get you to join my email list for a 10% discount, and then you're on your way. In that process, in the offline world, there is a conversation that's happening, right? You, I'm saying things to you. You are it's giving me feedback and I am in my head adjusting the conversation to make sure it's going in the way that is best, obviously, for the store, right? Mm-hmm. It's the, to sell some shoes and hopefully, obviously, to, to get you your win too and getting a nice pair of kicks. So we have that whole process. That happens offline. Online, there is mostly just marketers yelling at people all the time. <laughs> yeah. Buy our stuff. Here's our thing. Yep. Do this. Do that. And there is very little listening. And the reason that there isn't listening to the conversation, like imagine if I, if you came in the store and you said, you know, I said, Hey, welcome to shoe store. What kind of shoes can I help you with? And you're like, actually, I was looking for the tire place. I'm like, oh yeah, they moved. They're across the street. Mm-hmm. Right. What would happen in the offline world, if it was, if this was digital is I would then follow you to the tire store and ask you to buy shoes once you're done the tire store. And I'll do that for about three days, just in case, right. You were still interested in the <laughs> shoes, which you were never interested in. You no. were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Now, offline, I obviously know not to do that, but digitally, yeah. they do it all the time. We do it all the time. That is that is not listening to the market. So as an example, when it, when it comes to measurement, this is where the whole measurement marketing concept comes from. Measurement is how we listen to their side of the conversation. It's how they tell us what they like or what they don't. It's how they do the nod sell. It's how they say, yeah, I'm with you so far. Yeah. Or no, I'd rather hear more about that. That's measurement. Marketing is what we do to change the conversation to keep it going in the direction we want it to go. And that's the whole measure marketing concept. So when you understand that you're in, in the world of digital, especially, there's such, to your point earlier, there's such an opportunity with the, the tech that we have that's mm-hmm. available, the, being the fact that we're in a digital component, that we can listen to this conversation. And just like if I had a store, a, an offline store with a salesperson, and if that salesperson insulted you as soon as you came in, I would have a word with that salesperson and be like, hey, man, I know you think that was like the sarcasm was probably pretty good, but let's work on your script a little bit, right? Let's make sure they, we, they're able to come in the store before you freak them out. You can freak them out later, right? That sort of thing. But digitally, we can do the same thing. We can listen and say, is the homepage having the conversation that it is supposed to have with the, the user? And if it's not, then we can edit that homepage. We can change the homepage. We can train the homepage to do a better job. Like in our case, our homepage is a directory. It's not designed to get 12 minutes. I don't want somebody 12 minutes on my homepage. That homepage has done a horrible job. The homepage is supposed to be there. So that very quickly within a minute, they can get the way they need to go and get on right with the customer journey. That's what the homepage is. It's an information booth. That's all it's for. And so we can measure for that. And we have an expectation of what this page is supposed to do, the sale it's supposed to be making and the conversation that it's supposed to be having with the users. And measurement tells us that, yes, the users are going, yeah, this is cool. If I get a bunch of users that are sticking around on the homepage for 20 minutes, it's not having the right conversation yep. or something else going on. But if they're coming in and going to the next spot within a minute, okay, mission achieved, right? That, that step is done. I don't have to worry about tweaking my homepage. I know it's doing its job. Now let's work on the offer pages or the cart pages or whatever the other customer journey steps are. And I guess with uh, you must do a bit of work around that tailoring your communication to the audience uh, with powerful email systems like Active Campaign, where you mm-hmm. can Active actually campaign. we use Infusionsoft ourselves. Keep yep. now, now it's called Keep, but yeah, exactly. The email automation is exactly you know because you can, again, same thing. You can base upon behavior. Yep. Right. And that's the beauty of measurement. It's not asking somebody, well, "Would you buy this?" It's watching them. Yeah. Right. It's the actions. It's the activities. It's the behaviors that they leave behind. That's what tells you the real thing. That Creative but effective. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. <laughs> yeah. That's great. And that you can change the email sequence based on their what their behaviors have been on the website or in the the email sequence they've already had, et cetera. It's really really powerful these days. Mm-hmm. And the creepy, I tell you, the creepy part is only when it's too personalized. Yeah. yeah. Right. Otherwise, it's convenient. <clears throat> and that's the thing is, if you're noticed, that's the creepy. 
But if it's yeah. not noticed, you're like, oh, I just have you ever read copy where you're you're having a com- literally a conversation in your head, right? Yeah, okay. That's what everybody does. And you're reading this page and you're like, gee, I wonder if they have. And then all of a sudden it's like, if you're wondering right now if we have, and you're like, oh my <laughs> God, they're in my yeah. head. Like that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. That's great marketing because that copywriter is having a conversation with you. They are moving you through the steps and you're having that conversation back with them. You can literally measure to see yep. if that stuff happened. And when you do, like, like in our case, we have the Academy Offer page I talked about, right? For the for that do-it-yourself program. We measure how many people loaded the page, which mm-hmm. we call the impression. We measure how many people were there 10 seconds later, which is introduced. This is because I don't want to chase them around if they're in the wrong place. Yep. Let them there at least 10 seconds. We measure interested, which means they're there 45 seconds and have scrolled halfway down. Then we measure investigated, which did you investigate the offer? Did you actually look at that pricing table for at least five seconds to potentially consider a purchase? And then we measure initiate. Did they click that button? So, so imagine our level of visibility into the mm, conversation. Yeah. If it's not, if the page isn't working, I know where it's not working. So you can get that can granular copy team. Sorry, the, you said the you said the pricing table. So you can actually see how many people. Are, wow, that's that's yeah. That's what you just did is the thing that I love doing. Where you're like, I can yep. never unsee that. Yeah. Like I didn't know you could do that. Yeah. Right. And but that's that, that's exactly right. So now when I when I have a certain expectation where let's say 10% of my people are going to go from offer to cart and then 40% yep. complete the cart, right? This is sort yep. of rough numbers. So if that's what I expect, if that's not happening, if offer to cart percentage is not happening, I have to go to the offer page and say, why is that not happening? Yeah. And of course, then this is where the, the random acts of marketing comes in, right? Where people are like, well. Uh, which I think is an old Dan, uh, Dan Kennedy term, but it's a good one because it's what happens. People go, well, let's change the headline. Well, I think the design should change. Well, my buddy says we should do a video instead. Well, I think we should change the offer. And then you're like, everyone just randomly guesses at stuff. But the Chased only them. people, mm-hmm. exactly. The Well, yes, but they guess, right? They guess mm-hmm. at what it is. The only people who actually know what to do is the customer, is the yep. user. Mm-hmm. And so if you measure for it and you go, well, is it the headline? Well, they've been there 10 seconds and they're showing interest and they investigated the offer they just didn't initiate. So it's probably not the headline. Headline yeah. got them. Was it the body copy? Probably not because it got them to investigate. Was it the offer? Mm, could be because the offer, they're going, I considered it and went, nah, not interested. I didn't, I wasn't interested enough to click on the cart. Yeah. Right. And so, but you'll know the part. That's the idea is that, you know, it's this part that needs to focus on. So you, you, as a company, we all have limited resources, right? Even large companies, we have limited resources. So now you know where to invest your marketing resources and and focus the marketing department to say, okay, we're now going to come up with brainstorm ideas to fix the offer for whatever this product is. Or if they're not sticking around more than 10 seconds, it's an above the fold, probably headline lead copy issue or potential design, but it's above the fold. And you're like, we're going to figure out why that expectation isn't being matched from the ad or whatever the traffic source is and let's fix it. But you know, it's this piece, not God, it could be one of 700 things. Now it's everybody's opinion. It's no, the customer said, I'm not with you here, but if you fix this, and this is the best part about it, when you fix it the next day, you will see improvement. Yeah, that's great. Terrific. Just closing out on that's the good creepy, the bad creepy. Did you ever hear that story of Target in the USA? Yeah, uh, selling about the, the the girl that was pregnant. It's like, yeah. oh, congratulations! And the dad was like, I don't think she's pregnant, and it turns out she was. Yeah, yeah, so they were data mining, obviously, and building yep. campaigns and sending coupons. And uh, I don't know who. I don't. Think, I don't think they were at Target for much longer. Who had the idea to um to mine yeah. the potentially pregnant uh, young women, but based yeah. on their purchasing habits and what they were buying, they then send them coupons for um, you know pregnancy products. So yeah, that right. is pretty- which makes sense as a marketer. You're like, oh, if we can do this, let's do this, right? But you're right. It it, it feels like you're predicting it, but you're really not. Yeah, you're just looking at behaviors and saying, well, you checked this site, you did this, you subscribed to this magazine, all of a sudden. And, you know, back in the day, this will happen less and less, but back in the day, everybody was selling the data into some big giant master database somewhere, yeah. which then spelled it out and said, oh, well, people just like, you know, you probably remember direct mail, right? We all remember direct mail, the original, you know, marketing, you need to buy a list of somebody who bought a house and just bought a car in the last 12 months. Yeah. Let's sell them furniture. Like they're going to buy furniture next because why people, that's what people do, their behaviors. And we know that. So they're likely candidates for new furniture. And it was like, so, and that's, it's just take gone to a whole new level yeah. now yeah. Uh, when it comes to that. Yeah. How did you fund your business? Uh, we did it the old fashioned way. We, uh, I came down to actually see a friend of mine get married in Austin. I was living in New York at the time and we fell in love with the place and we're like, okay, we both didn't really love our jobs. Um, and, uh, and so for us, it was like, we knew we weren't going to stay at those jobs very long. We didn't like, uh, where we were living in New York and nothing against New York. It's just, I grew up in the East coast. I had that. I didn't really want that anymore. And I loved Austin. We both did my wife and I. And so we went up and saved money for months until we had six months of salary. And then we came down and said, 
start the clock. <laughs> you got six months to figure it out. Yep. And that was, uh, you know, again, a little over a decade ago now. So great. But that's so how no, we did. We saved six months of money and did yep. it ourselves. Great. No, so no investors or bank finance, really? No, no. It's, been, it's been nice. Yeah. If you were to start up today with plenty of funding, would you go into your industry? Um, so yes, but I would you'd probably SaaS. Yep. If I was going to do it, I, I would go into some sort of SaaS uh, yep. oriented program for sure with, with the funding. Cause I think that requires funding because yep, it is a slow, painful, arduous process sometimes to get stuff done and you. And there's a lot of unforeseen thing. If I was just going to start a done for your agency, you honestly, you don't need it. Yep. You just need to go out there and show people what's possible. Do what you just did. You're going to see clients react the same way you did. Like, I didn't know you could do that. Yep. Well, well, what would you do if you knew all that stuff was, like, oh, well, in that case, like imagine creating a score of product details and seeing how many people actually looked at the images and investigated your reviews and then giving some sort of engagement score that you could retarget with people that are clearly showing interest, but just didn't pull the trigger. So you send them a 20% coupon. And it's their own behaviors that are telling you that they want, you know, that yep. they're likely to take advantage. Like, what would you do? You do that a lot. So done for your agency. You don't need a lot of money. You can, you can just learn the skills uh, and do that. But SaaS for sure. If I've got millions of dollars to spend, hundred <laughs> percent what I would do. Yeah. And for the audience, SaaS is software as a service. So it's cloud-based yes. um, yeah, um, software. Sort of cloud-based analytics platform or yeah. something like that. Like yeah. zero accounting software is built in the cloud for the cloud 10 years ago. It's awesome. It's kick-ass. Can you outline the most stressful point in your small business growth journey so audience can learn from it? Um, yes. So the most stressful point for me was realizing I was about to destroy it just for fun. So I had something to do. It really was. It was that realization of like, oh man, this is a pattern. I've done this before with other businesses and I know I'm going to, it's going to rip it apart so I can fix it and be the hero and I'll make money. I won't, it won't affect my money, but it'll affect the team. It yep. affects stability. It's a lot of other drawbacks to that. So it's not a great place to be. Um, and the way that I, the way that I learned that for me was um, I, I, I'm a, as you might imagine, a big systems guy. So I'm planning out stuff all the time. So I had a rough understanding of what revenues were month over month. We were making a bunch of money. We had that. It was fine. And during this period where I was probably watching Netflix a little too much than I, that I should have, some of that came around where I was like, oh, I'm making enough. I'm making enough. I'm, I'm, I'm making at least what I made last year. And then you get the numbers, right? And I think at the time we'd gone down to like, uh, 275 or something in rev, right? Yep. In total and in, in top line revenue. And we were at like 300 before that and we'd gone down. So it wasn't a ton, but it was a chunk. Yeah. And it profitable it was still profitable. So that was there, but it was down. We'd never gone down. We've never gone backwards. And it was because I took my off the ball and I, and it was stressful because I'm like, okay, two things are about to happen. One is I'm going to win quote unquote, and I'm going to destroy the company so I can fix it. And it was just going to be super stressful. Or I have to radically exponentially improve the system that I'm using right now to run the business, which is the one that I did. Yep. So I decided to hunker down. And what I did was I get incredibly good at forecasting. So now what we do, and we have for the last three years now, since we did this, uh, this turnaround was uh, we forecast out what our results would be. I always market forward. I will never market back. I never drive the car using the rear view mirror. You always mm -hmm. drive the windshield, right? So we're always, so what I'm doing is I'm looking through, let's say for the Academy as a, as an example, I have a forecast of how many offer page views that Academy is going to get next week. I know of a percentage of what the percentage is that are going to see the cart. I know the percentage of that they're going to complete. I know what the average ticket's going to be. And I know how many of those are going to be monthly, how many of those are going to be annual. So I can predict revenue. I've done that for next week. I've done that for the week after, and I've done that every week for about a year. So I've got through December at this point uh, in the times of this conversation, penciled out just of what that product's going to do. Yep. But I have different categories, right? I have to do it yourself products and got different levels of those. I've done with you products, different levels of those, done for your products, different levels of those. So all of those have weekly forecasts, but they're not, oh, $10,000. I don't do that. I forecast the activities that I'm going to get. And in particular, the marketers, the marketing team is going to get so I can direct them. And so they can measure themselves. So how many offers did you get the eyeballs that you needed to? If not, why not? Which traffic source didn't work as expected and let's go fix it. And then did it work in the same efficient, in the way that it was supposed to by the, by the percentages that it went to the cart and eventually purchased. And the second something's off, they know exactly where to go focus and fix. So you, knowing you're, that- You're using, sorry, you're using more lead measures obviously than lag measures. Uh, correct. Yep. Yeah. And, but we always compare it to actual, right? So I have my projections yep. of what's going on and they've got my actual. So mm -hmm. I can compare and say, okay, is this is this pattern changing at all? Is the market changing at all? Obviously, COVID's going to throw yes. in a kicker mm -hmm. or two. Um, but using that system, we've predicted out our revenue scarily close uh, year after year, which is good. So I know in the beginning, and here's what's most important about this, 
is the conversations I'm having with my team are not about, let's say we're recording this in the uh, end part of July, 2021. Mm-hmm. So we're, I'm not having conversations with my team about July numbers at all. I'm not even having conversations about August numbers. We're yeah. talking about October, November, and December numbers right now. And we're looking at those forecasts saying, okay, is that good? If that is good, if we like those numbers, then we turn the conversation to how do we execute the plan to make sure we hit the activities? Because if we hit the activities, the, the money is a symptom of the system, yep. which is what I want it to be, right? Now, if we look at those numbers, we say, let's pretend for a second, I needed $100,000, but I'm only projecting $10,000. Well, now I know that's my crystal ball. I know I can look at my crystal ball and say, hey, in five months, it's going to be a shit show. What are we <laughs> going to do right now, Yes, right now, to make sure that we are putting different things into play to make that change? How yeah. are we going to do this? And mm-hmm. that's where everybody brainstorms. What about this? Or we could do this. Oh, you know what we could do? We could do this. We do this as a sale. We just, and then you tweak the numbers and all of a sudden it gets back up to the 100,000 you need. Now it's cool. Execute that plan. That's make great. That, yeah. And you focus on that. So the system itself creates that result. And now my challenge is obviously to cheat to others. So that I can get more and more out of the way, but it is it has worked amazingly well. It's led to our growth, and it's that idea of a crystal ball. So I never have to worry about walking into the month wondering what's going to happen. I already know the, I already know the month. I'm not worried about the month at all. What I what I look for is four to six months out because yeah. I've got time to change that, good or bad, right? I've got time to make those changes to to steer and and steer the ship a little bit better. A great book on lead measures and using those much much more powerful than lag measures is uh, Four Disciplines of Execution. Have you read mm-hmm. that? Yeah, I have. Yep. One of Stephen Covey's sons is one of the authors, I believe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and it's right. Cause lag measures, if you think about it, they've literally already happened. Yes. It's yes. too late. Like, oh, I made $10,000, but I needed 20,000. Well, now I've missed a goal. Yeah. And that's what a lot of people do. That's what, I mean, I, I did it when I first started. Right? Yeah. I was like, oh, my goal is $10,000 this month or whatever the number was. And it was like, oh, you hit it or you didn't. But there wasn't any understanding of how you didn't hit it or how yeah. you did hit it. And when you put in those steps and you say, well, here are the activities that are going to lead to that. As long as those activities work in the way we're supposed to work, as long as the dominoes line up in the way they've lined up before, then I'm going to hit my number. It's, it's, you don't have to worry about the revenue. It's obviously, it's definitely going to be there. It just will. And then if it's not, you will see very quickly how it's yeah. not going to be there and you can fix it. You still have time to do that. And that's what the beauty of it is. What area in business do you feel you've had to work on the most to add the greatest value? I think the area in business for me that I've had to work on the most is um, getting out of the room because uh, understanding the, how do, how do I talked about before about getting out of the individual roles? Um, one thing I did, uh, it was a big, big change in the systems that we did in terms of me leading a team is I didn't, I, I wanted a break, right? I want to be able to take a vacation and, and not have to be the person who's always pushing the ball forward, whether it's a, a team that you're leading or a larger organization. But I realized I'm like, okay, well, what we're going to do is I'll be in the, the meeting, but I'm not going to say anything, mm-hmm. right? So this is my first attempt at this. And what happened, as you might imagine, is everyone's like, okay, what is this? Okay, what do you guys think? Okay, well, we think this. And you could feel the virtual heads turning to me <laughs> and just waiting for me to jump in, Yeah, right? You could feel it because they would just stop and wait, well, Mercer, what do you think? And I'm like, oh, like I'm, I can't be in the room. Yeah, because if I am, I'm going to stop the process. Mm-hmm. So what we did is I started, I, I, I redesigned. This is a little bit um, agile, like you know how the yep. agile stuff works. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it was a little bit where we said, okay, we're going to do what we call them headline calls. Um, and so I work with my team manager, my team leads, and I'll say, okay, we have a 15 minute period, and I do. I have eight, eight, fifteen, eight, fifteen, eight, thirty, eight, thirty, eight, forty five, eight, forty five, the nine, one, two, three, four. They are back to back. They are fast, and no one's got time to BS at all, right? So it's mm-hmm. like. Here's what's going on. Tell me the headlines of what's happening in the department, what the wins are, what the blocks are, where you need me to help. Yeah. And right. sometimes it's just a quick status update and everything's good. Sometimes it's, hey, I need this, I need this, I need this. Okay, cool. I'll get these done and, and we, we take a solution offline. But what's happened in order to do that, they have had to have the other meetings. They have to be on the ball or else their 15 minutes isn't comfortable yep. because if they don't have any updates, I'm asking harder questions and yep. they have to have those answers. Yeah. So that's that's worked out really, really well for us. What have you enjoyed least about managing a fast growth? I, I think, um, what have I enjoyed least about it? I don't know that I've enjoyed, I don't think I, I have enjoyed, hmm, it's a really good question. I think the least part has been that, that sometimes, uh, just brass tacks, right? It's not all roses. Like sometimes it is overwhelming. Sometimes you have a lot to do. And sometimes you feel like, God, I shouldn't have to do this part anymore. Hmm. Right. Where you get to a point where you're like, oh, I'm the owner now, or I'm the I'm not just a freelancer hustler kind of owner, but you're like, you've moved beyond hustle and now you have to hustle again, even if it's for a day or two. Right. So I'm not talking a lot. 
But, but those times, sometimes you're like, oh, like, I just don't really want to, I don't enjoy that. I don't enjoy the being forced to, or feeling like I have a job, like I'm trapped by the organization without me, nothing is possible. So what I do is when I start to feel that I try to immediately turn it into, okay, that is just because the system is not yet strong enough to take it. Let's focus on the system because I do enjoy that part, building systems. So I'll try to channel that energy <laughs> into a more productive way. Well, I think I know the answer to the next question. What do you love most about growing a small business? 100% systems. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you go. Oh, yeah. I'm a yeah, systems. Man. That I'm is, I'm a, too, so, I'm yeah. a geek. I'm a geek for systems. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm always like, did the person, and my team knows it. Like, I'll be like, did the person produce the result or did the system produce the result? Yeah. Like, well, yeah. I, I remember to do da, da, da. Well, then what is that? Well, that's, that's not, that's me remembering. Okay. So yeah. we're going to make it write a checklist down. So next time it's the system. Cause you're not going to remember the next time. Don't that's right. right. You're setting totally. for failure. Yep. Totally agree. Love, love systems. Yeah. What's been the biggest mindset shift for you in your small business growth journey? Roles. Yep. Figuring out the roles. So, so maybe two, I say roles. Number one is, is understanding that I'm, I'm looking at the org chart and my job is to replace myself everywhere except the investor. Right. Yeah. Yep. Maybe eventually investor, as I saw it off, if I ever wanted to do that, but I like the idea of keeping it right. Why, why get rid of it? So doing that, but along the way, it was also giving yourself permission as an entrepreneur, because you, again, you, especially entrepreneurs, they, they feel they're the heroes a lot, right? Like, oh, I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. Or you have to do it sometimes if it's just the power of one, but realizing like you are good at certain things and your job is to make sure that you are spending the time doing the thing that you are really good at. And in the beginning, I promise you, you do not know what that is no. because you're so good at it. You cannot see it, mm. you know, and that's, and that's the issue in the beginning is you go, well, I guess I'm good at spreadsheets. Like I'm good at spreadsheets, but I don't want to do that for a living. You know what I mean? Like I can handle a spreadsheet, but I don't want to do that for a living. What I'm really good at, the thing that I'm really good at is I see systems everywhere. I'm like that kid on the sixth sense. It's like, I, see <laughs> just, yeah. it's like I see systems. You yeah. know, it's like the system doesn't know it's a system. I'm like, that's how it is for me. I see systems <laughs> everywhere. For me, it's the matrix. I see the oh, matrix. Yep. I'm like, cool. Yep. I get dodge bullets, you know? <laughs> um, but but I, for a long, long time, I never saw that as a thing. I just discounted it because it was so easy for me because that is my natural talent when we all have that right we all have a natural talent it was so easy for me that i discounted it as not a skill right because it just didn't require anything from for me but other people it's a super skill and then realizing like hey put yourself in the position where the thing that is just natural that you're good at just yeah. do more of that yeah. and you level that up and then find other people who are super skills at other things as an example husband and wife team right we started one of the first hires we made was my wife yep from her job oh Man, that's a whole other podcast you would like. <laughs> How did that yeah. go? The headline. Marriage counseling. Yes. <laughs> oh my God. It was yeah. crazy. Yeah. And here's why. Because I would say, hey, I need you to do da 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 da. She would say, I don't know how to do that. And of course, that's driving me nuts because I'm like, Google it. How hard is it? <laughs> right. So we have this head to head yep. stuff. I'm just an entrepreneur and getting everything done. And she's, yep. from my perspective, fighting me at every point. <laughs> so we learn, and this came from a Dan Kennedy uh, training. Yep. So I love Dan Kennedy stuff. Uh, a strategic coach, but they, they was talking about this concept of process and project. And he's like, there's two people and they are never the same. They, they do not, you do not have both. You're one or the other project is where you see the whiteboard and you're like, hell yeah, let's party. I can yep. <laughs> create something process. People see the whiteboard and they're like, oh my God, they freeze. They have no idea what to do. They don't want that. They need a process. Yep. They need to follow step-by-step. Step. So as an example, what I realized was, and this is, this is my learning with her was a very incredible lesson for team management too, because we use it for all of our team members as well, is uh, invoices, right? So I was doing invoices. Now in the beginning, invoices are fun. I'm creating a system for invoices. After a while, invoices are a process and now I'm bored. I don't want to do invoices as much. And so I delay invoices, which delays being paid, which delays cash flow, right? So this is all in the early days. So I all of a sudden I'm like, hey, can you do these invoices? And she's like, what's the system for the invoices, right? Is there a whiteboard? I'm like, there's no whiteboard. I already have it planned out. Here's the, here's the process. Oh, okay, cool. I'll do that. Invoices go out on time. They're like clockwork. Yeah. She does them a year in advance because she knows how clients are going to this forever. So she's got it all done. And it's just, I don't have to worry about it anymore. That's the power of process versus project. I am fueled by creating things. Mm -hmm. She is fueled by executing on a plan and then yeah. she will tweak it. She will definitely tweak it and make it better, but she just doesn't want to start with a blank slate. But she, yeah. she's fueled by that where that drains me. The fact that I have to create an invoice for 10 grand, which again, is decent mm -hmm. money. But me having, I'm like, oh, I'll do it tomorrow because it's a process and it drains me. But project, I put myself in project, put her in the process stuff and you get the right skills to the right people, the right tasks to the right people that way. It'll change the organization practically overnight and it will help your marriage.
<laughs> and does your wife still work in the business? She does. <laughs> Great. <laughs> she does. She handles as as it was just kind yeah. of funny. She handles a lot of her automation. She has the most actually all of her automation. She does all the infusion soft stuff. She builds all that stuff out. She obviously does invoices and um, some account support issues as well. She on with account support. Yeah. So not so much on the instructor end of things, um, but definitely on the account support. Like lost my password, I need to upgrade and that sort of stuff. But it's all process, right? Yes. Which is she loves. What's the number one habit you think a small business owner needs to develop and maintain? Um, I think it's an openness to accept where you are is one uh, to see, to see where you are. Uh, Cause I've, I've worked with sometimes when I, when I've just worked with other entrepreneurs and, and talk with them about some of their businesses and uh, they sometimes just don't see the chaos that they're creating. They don't see that they're doing this over and over again. They're just sort of, you know, in this up and down cycle and it's just a cycle and it's going to rinse and repeat and they're not actually making progress. Um, and so helping them have visibility into actually what is going on is a big deal. Um, so that, that's, that's the, the biggest thing is if as a habit, if you can get to the point of realizing, okay, this is how I know where I am, right? Because the numbers line up here because I understand how I'm getting my results. I know my results. I know how I'm getting my results. Very important story that you have to know. And then when you know where you are and you have a very clear picture of where you're going, now it's easier to get there. It's like the path automatically just sort of unfolds before you. It becomes a lot easier to see what steps to take. What happens a lot of time is there's, there's an entrepreneur that, that would have an idea of where they're going, right? They want to, oh, I want a billion dollar company or whatever the thing is. So they're heading in this fuzzy-ish future and they think that they are standing on solid ground for where their company is right now. But in reality, they've borrowed too much. They've really been fueling off debt, not off revenues. They haven't been doing any customer acquisition. The acquisition they had wasn't, wasn't retained. And so they're constantly spinning and they're not going to, they're going to scale themselves poor, right? But they can't see that. So they think they're on solid ground because they have a ton of money in the bank. And what's up happening is they're actually in the middle of the ocean. And so they jump off the boat thinking I'm on solid ground and they end up drowning. And this is why, because they didn't realize where they were. So when you measure your business, when you measure the different aspects of it and you, and you have a card hold or a, a cold, hard, skeptical look at yeah. your business, right? Assume that you're not amazing. And you look at, look for reasons why it's not amazing. And you see the ugly warts and go like, okay, ugly warts, but I'll fix them. Right. That's, that's the nature of our business. So, so that would, that's why I would recommend it. So get, get aware of where you right. are and accept that. Be the change you want to see in your business. Become more productive and less stressed with our free Transform Your Performance online course. Once you see the benefits, put your entire team through the course at no cost. We start out by telling you the secret to guaranteed success. Then over 100 lessons help you be more focused, present, productive, and feel more in control about work. Growasmallbusiness.com. These next couple of questions we've covered a little bit on, so adding people to the team or, or building a sustainable kick-ass culture. Any other comments around either of those things? Uh, biggest thing is when you're hiring to filter, filter, filter. Your yep. job is not to hire the right person. Your job is to get rid of all the wrong people. That the interview is process is, is a process of keeping people it, out. It's a funnel. That's exactly yeah. right. So like, for example, like the, the Philippine stuff, we'll say like, uh, if like let's say I'm looking for a WordPress developer at the bottom of the post, I have a really long post with lots of questions and, and secret stuff in there. And then I'll say at the bottom, like, Hey, if this is of interest, reply back with like, um, you know, the, um, you know, need, need a great sales page as a subject line. And um, it's, it's completely different from what they're, but they only would have gotten it if they're detailed. Remember the person that's applying for the job is the best they will ever be period. They are putting on everything for you right now, the mm -hmm. best they will ever be. So what happens sometimes is people will like, well, I checked their resume and the resume looks awesome, but they did miss the, the subject line thing. And they didn't tell me their famous breakfast food or whatever the thing is you're telling them to do, but their, their resume looks good. I'm pretty sure they could do the skills. And I'm like, they've already not paid attention to detail yeah. and they're the best they're ever going to be. So imagine when they come on board, start getting a paycheck and get lazy. Yes. Like that's, what's going to happen. I guarantee because they're already demonstrating those behaviors. Again, don't, don't make a reason why they're a good fit. Make them prove they already are the person you want to hire, that they already yeah. have those skills. Tell our audience how you've handled balance. Uh, that's a really good question. I do a bit of meditation um, just to, it's it's like a, a pause in the in the ocean when the ocean's rocking back and forth, right? It's like, okay, my calm little lake for a few minutes a day, I'll do something like that. Um, otherwise, I try to get out in nature, do a little bit of hiking. I will do that. I will also take, as I talked about before, uh, a week vacation where I completely disconnect uh, and just get out and have a change of pace, whether it's I'm driving eight hours somewhere because, you know, COVID. And so it's a limited look what you can do um, or back when you could travel to travel somewhere and get a break. I will do that to 
to get a flip side because I think it's important. Recovery is important, and it's not often uh, respected enough by entrepreneurs because we tend to be the superheroes, right? We're like, yeah. oh, we can take it, we can do it, we can tough it out. But if you do that, if you're working in a gym and you're working out and yeah. you work out 24 hours straight, you're just going to break. Your body yes. will break. Mm -hmm. And the muscles don't build unless, unless there's recovery is happening. So you have to have that recovery. Your mind is the same way. Your ideas are the same way. That's why yeah. everyone's famous for getting ideas in the shower because it's the weird <laughs> times or overnight when you have a dream, you're like, oh my God, that's I can do this now. You wake up with a solution. It's because your brain had a chance to recover, to process, and your brain needs that ability. So if you're always thinking about the idea and you're never taking a chance to disconnect and have a radically different experience of life for even a brief, it doesn't take a long time, but a brief period of time, then your brain can't recover. So you have to give it opportunities to recover. How much professional development have you invested in yourself? Courses, you know, training, conferences, yeah. podcasts, et cetera? That's a really, really good question. Um, extensively. Um, so yes, podcasts all the time. Um, part of the reason we're on this one. So I do a lot of podcasts. I do um, a lot of books uh, that are coming through. W one thing I've noticed with books is the older I get, the kind of, it's just all rinse and repeat. You start realizing like, yep. you know, it's like my, the, my favorite one was um, when everyone's like, oh, I need an integrator now. And I'm like, back in my day, they called that an operations person. Yeah. You know, it was like, <laughs> and then 20 years before that, it was called something else. And yeah. 20 years from now, it'll be called something else because some mm -hmm. marketer is going to rename it. And they're going to write a book saying, oh, you really need this. And everyone's going to be like, ah. <laughs> so at a certain point, I start to see a pattern again, right? Imagine that patterns and systems. So I see a pattern. I'm like, okay, so some of these things are saying the same thing over and over again. Um, but the I have invested a lot in, in high-end coaching programs to force me to think differently sometimes, to challenge me, to have somebody say, ah, I don't really know about that. Because it's tough to say no to entrepreneur. I tell my team that all the time. Yeah. Again, it's like if I tell my team to jump off the cliff, right? I don't, I want, I want them saying, uh, it's a cliff, yeah. right? Because again, maybe I know that, but maybe I don't. Maybe I was just going too fast. I need somebody to push back. And sometimes a coach will do that for you. So I have done that. But I'm yeah. a big fan of personal development. I can't rely on myself. No, that's great. No, that was the next question, mentors and coaches. So that's great. Mm -hmm. uh, what about board of directors or advisors? Do you have one at the moment? We don't actually. Yep. Um, we do. I do have, um, and I've thought about that to, to be able to, to build that out. We, I have a lot of friends and a lot of mastermind groups. So there's that yep. sort of connection. Yep. Um, so in that way, maybe that's what's happened is masterminds have sort of taken over the traditional board yes. of directors roles. Yeah. Um, so we do have that. I do, I do quite a bit of those again with other entrepreneurs from different industries um, just to get an idea, because especially when I want to learn about business in general, right? It's not always, they have to be a measure marketing business. Like that's not the concept. Um, but if I have business owners uh, in a similar venue or, or models, it's useful. Right, Minister, we're on to our final five questions. What do you think is the hardest thing in growing a small business? I think the hardest thing about growing a small business is getting your getting you out of the way, getting yep. the systems in place. It really is. It's because it's so easy to jump in and fix stuff. It's so easy to be like, you know what? Never mind. I'll take care of it. And it's especially when you hire too. somebody. Yeah. It's it's it's, it is addictive, right? Because you get to be the hero again, yeah. right? It's like, oh, I get to prove my value. It's good for the ego. Yeah. You feel connected again. You feel like, oh, it's good to be able to play around. Um, but it's it's a it's a really, really detrimental thing to long-term growth. So get it on systems and get comfortable with hiring somebody and having them be 80% as good as you. Yep. Because what will happen is they will be in the beginning, right? And remember, when you hire your first person, you hire two. You're hiring them and you're hiring the boss, which is now the new role that you have. Yes. In addition to all the other crap that you didn't have time for. <laughs> so that's that's how it's that's how it is, right? Um, but again, if you if you focus on the system, that's what's going to grow the organization. So you you get good at that. And what will happen is, and this happened recently for me, our marketing guy um, was 80% as good as some of the stuff. And then very quickly, he got much better because he learned our way of doing stuff. And now all of his skill could yeah. then come in. And now it's he's like 300% better than I am <laughs> at a lot of this. And I'm like, dude, I just want to not get in your way. That's yep. my job now is not to get in the way, um, which is great. Because a lot of times entrepreneurs feel like they're pulling mules yep. from behind them and that's mm -hmm. their team. And it should be that the thoroughbreds are pulling your team yes. forward. And that's the idea. So it's 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 having those team and, and treating them as such because they're, they're incredible, you know, incredible team members. Every business book, which has helped you the most. Um, I liked, uh, there is a business blueprint, Keith yes. Cunningham mm -hmm. business blueprint, really good. It, it's numbers oriented a little bit, but it does put the, he does a good job of putting what are typically cryptic reports. Like, why do I need a cash flow report? Why do I need yep. a PL? Like other than what, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs get it from the bookkeeper, pass it on the accountant yep. and doesn't, don't even look at it. Right. But he does a really good job of saying, Hey, here's how to actually use it to mm -hmm. guide the ship right? The shift that is your business. So that one's a good one. Any great podcasts or online learning tools you use for your own professional development? 
I listen a lot to, uh, there's a lot of them, but I listen a lot to uh, strategic coaches stuff. Dan Sullivan mm-hmm. does a great job yep. and gives out a ton of content, does not mm-hmm. hold back, yep. uh, which I love. And we've done his high-end training program too. It's a really good program. Um, but his stuff, I, I really like a lot. One tool you'd recommend to help grow a small business? Um, well, this is going to be self-serving too, but I would say, you know, you have to have measurement. Yeah. You know, you got to have measurement. So your company, if you're, if you're using, if you're not using analytics, that's a, a no brainer. You Google analytics. analytics. Yeah, it's awesome. 100%. Yeah. But if you are using analytics and have been for a period of time, you really probably should now level up to adding in tag manager and yep. data studio yep. to right. really have the whole suite of products, because the better you are at visibility, the way I look at it is like a prescription glasses. If yep. I don't, if I have really bad eyesight, if I find an old prescription glasses that I have, they're not perfect, but they're almost not bouncing the walls anymore, right? Because I have some visibility in what's happening. Yep. And then I'll get a better prescription later. And then I'll get a better prescription later. And then I'll get a better prescription later. It is like that with measurements. So don't try to do too much too soon with those tools, mm-hmm. but at least get started using them and, and then get better at them as you go. Because there's a lot changing in the world of measurement. Mm-hmm. And it's, uh, it's important to be part of a, a department now. There should be a measurement department, measurement roles in an organization. Finally, my favorite question, what would you tell yourself on day one of starting out? It's going to be okay. <laughs> it's, it's going to work out. Yeah. It's going to work out. There's going to be ups and downs, but, but it's going to work out. So just keep at it. You know, cause I, I think, um, you know, in that first day, it was like, especially for us, it was like six month clock. Right. And that's it. Like we didn't make the money in six months. We're like, well, I'm getting a job somewhere. And that was not where we wanted to go. Um, and I think to be very honest, uh, there was that voice inside my head that was telling me that to be yeah. honest, to sit there and say, okay, you know what, we're going to make this because I never worried about getting a job. I never thought about, well, I guess I could do this or this, or at least I can do that. It wasn't like, well, at least I can work for this part. It was like, okay, I got, there was offers, there was opportunities and I just hit it hard and over and over and over again. And I listened to the market. So when the market, it wasn't me. And this is why I don't have a website that trains people how to do WordPress training videos. Cause the market was like, that's a lot. Can you build the video or can you build them? Well, Hey, can you make them better with optimization? Well, Hey, can you set up our analytics? I listened to the market. And then the market told me, here's what we want. And all I did was provide, provide that for them. I just paid attention. Well, thanks very much for your time today, Mercer. I think your audience got a shit ton of value out of what you shared with us. Congratulations on your journey and your growth and success and, and the wider team. I think it's yeah, phenomenal. Um, well done. Yeah, happy to help and appreciate you having me. Thanks, Troy. And for our audience, we would greatly appreciate a review in iTunes or whatever platform you listen to us on. More reviews means we bubble up higher in iTunes, etc. So more business owners looking for podcasts to help with their growth will find us. 